welcome to everybody around the world listening to this broadcast. Um, as Sue says, I'm going to be talking about where is social media research right now as we come to the end of 2012 and where is it going to be tomorrow. So first of all, what is social media research? Well, first of all, there's a, a narrow definition which is just listening, searching and monitoring using tools like Radian 6 and Scout Labs um, to either passively just listen for stuff or to actively passively listen if that's not too much of an oxymoron. Um, it means not engaging in conversations with people but simply trying to find out what is happening out there. Then there's netnography which is ethnography applied to the social media going in and looking at a human scale at individual conversations finding out what people are saying usually engaging with those people as well so it's not just passive listening. The next category of what could be called social media inspired research so online communities, um, a lot of the smartphone type research getting people to do blogging themselves is another category. Then there's researching social media, what works in social media, how much should companies invest in social media, what's the return on investment through different channels and different opportunities. Then of course social media as a sample source, how can we use it to bring people in to be able to do perhaps conventional market research with them, focus groups through to surveys and most recently we've seen a real growth in people integrating social media into mainstream research and we've got some uh, papers on that later in the day. So I'd like to introduce you to the Gartner hype cycle. Now this is not a mathematical formula. There is no strict rule to the shape of this curve, but it's got some interesting properties that uh, Gartner have talked about. So we have the peak of inflated expectations. So often we see this hype, 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 followed by the trough of disillusionment as the new technique fails to deliver everything that its hardened advocates and uh, the people most interested in selling it were putting forward. Then as we start to understand what it can really deliver and as the tools tend to get a little bit better as well we get what they call the slope of enlightenment and then we have the plateau of productivity perhaps a little bit twee as naming conventions go but it's a pattern which I'm sure you can see being applied to technology after technology after technology as time goes by. So where is social media research at the moment? Well I think it's somewhere in this red shaded area. We're heading down the trough of disillusionment. We had the over, um, over excitement, we had speculation that social media research might replace a very large part of conventional research, that it would answer all sorts of problems, that it would be cheap, that it would be easy, um, that it would give us great new insight and it's turned out to have some problems, I'm going to mention those and so there is this trough of disillusionment but I am fairly convinced that they will be a, a turning round, that the tools will get a little bit better but our understanding of how to use them will get much, much better um, and there are some, there's a great video on the training day from Annie Pettit a couple of days ago, you're going to hear some more interesting things soon um, about what's going on. So I can see that all making um, a turnaround but the thing I don't really know is whether we're at the top of that decline into the trough or whether we're near the bottom and 2013 are probably going to uh, tell us that. So we mustn't forget while we're in this trough heading direction what the strengths are. It can be very fast. You've got a question now, you can look backwards and find out what those queries were. We are talking about real conversations between real customers, not artificial um, situations that we have created where we ask people we often find that social media will answer questions that we haven't even asked, sometimes that we haven't even thought about and that is great. Also it reflects salience. Sometimes you can't do social media research about a brand because nobody is talking about the brand. Well that itself is a message. Um, it may be a major brand but if nobody is talking about it then the, the results we get back from market research surveys where we make people talk about our brand are going to be somewhat artificial because we're forcing them to talk about something they wouldn't normally talk about. Social media research is in the real world context and there have been some real successes out there um, and we've seen some fantastic ability to predict share prices under some circumstances, election results and so on. So what are the weaknesses? Well the, one of the key ones is demographics. It's very hard to know 
which country the people making a comment are coming from, which is often pretty fundamental. It's hard to know whether they're users or non-users. It's hard to know whether they're male or female. So we're not talking about subtle demographics. Really very basic demographics are quite hard to tell about social media research. Facebook is the most exciting thing in social media. Um, over a billion people on it, but we can't ethically search most of it. So the fact that it's opaque to us means that there is a major hole in the idea that social media listening is really reaching this massive number of people because the most common tool we can't reach. Automated sentiment analysis turns out to be much, much worse than we thought it was going to be. I'm sure it will improve, but at the moment, most good practitioners do some or all of their coding manually, which is holding back social media research. And actually, it's a bit more expensive to use than we expected it to be. Netnography, uh, great book to read on it. This is still the seminal work after three, about three years, which is a long time in uh, internet speak. Going in and finding out conversations. If we look at uh, this Google Trends plot of interest in netnography around the world, we see that there wasn't any um, until about late 2008. Then it peaked as Robert Cozinet started talking about the topic and published his book. We get a spike, and then we get a gentle but erratic climb. It's a really useful te um, technique and tool but it's only occasionally used. It is slow, it is expensive, it can be very insightful. There are some great case studies if you want to type in uh, Nivea's stain manual um, into uh, Google after the, the presentations, you'll find out about a really interesting netnography study where Nivea were able to come up with some new deodorants. In terms of social media inspired research, the biggest one is communities. Um, and communities are an incredibly diverse set of things. They range from 30 people in some communities to 50,000 in others. They range from lasting just a few days to a few years. We have qualitative only communities. Um, traditionally, these have been called MROCs. We have community panel type communities, which are long lasting and larger. And more recently, we've seen the growth of what some people are calling short term community panels, um, which are maybe lasting two, three, four weeks, but have hundreds or thousands of members in them. So all of these have learnt from social media. They use many of the characteristics of social media. To the respondents, they often feel like social media. Um, and that has been a really strong area. So much so that the GRIT report reported that it's the fastest growing major research technique. SMR have reported that it's 3% of all market research and growing. And here are a couple of major names in the industry, Scott Miller from Vision Critical um, and Mike Hall, recently of Verve but now of Intuned Research, talking about just how strong they expect it to be in the future, using numbers like 20% of all research, so certainly one to keep an eye on. Again, inspired by social media, we have smartphone-enabled research, and there are some fantastic tools out there from Steve August, Revelation, and CMAX Solaris Ethos, um, New Kids on the Block Kiosk, and lots of other people. Allowing ordinary people to capture slices of their life, to take part in projects that at the least can give us insight, and at the best can be a form of ethnography. They do tend to be time consuming. They're not particularly inexpensive, but they can give you real access to what's going on in people's lives um, inside those everyday moments. Then we have researching social media, and this is really important to, to clients. They've got to find out what is working. What is like actually worth? How important is talking about? And uh, the brand that I see being talked about the most in this context is Social Bakers. If you've not dealt with them, do go to their website. They've got some fantastic tools. They've got a variety of tools, but for me, their best ones are when they're working with Facebook. They produce some really good insight into what's going on inside Facebook. Um, they're a recognized um, co-producer with Facebook, and they start concentrating not so much on how many people like you, but how many people are talking about you and the relationship between the people talking about you and the people liking you, and where you sit compared with your competitors, and how you can monitor that without having to log on every day. And there are lots of other tools out there. Most of these tools 
are not provided by market researchers. So we need to know how to understand these tools, how to work with these tools when we're talking to our clients about how should they be researching their media spend, how should they be researching their effectiveness, effectiveness their viral campaigns and so on. Social media is a sample source. Well, the, the oldest kids on the block here are uh, Peanut Labs, who are part of Research Now, who have kindly helped sponsor this with a booth. Um, they're still the main player that I'm aware of in this area of trying to use social media as a supply of conventional market research samples. But we have some very new options. It's been possible to do surveys via Twitter for a long time, but now we have Twitter surveys with Nielsen tie-up. That's going to be interesting. I think that there are some real limitations down the route, uh, but it's certainly interesting. Google consumer surveys out there as well, sourcing sample in a new way, having some real successes, having some shocking failures, and if you uh, have a look at the Wikipedia story where at one stage it was thought that maybe one in eight Americans contribute to Wikipedia when it turns out to be somewhat less than one in a thousand. But nevertheless, some very interesting things going on in that space, and we really must avoid just sort of sniffing and saying, oh, well, I can see the failings. Yes, there are failings. There are also strengths, and the failings are going to be addressed. What about integrating social media into mainstream market research? I think this is going to be one of the most important areas. Um, one of the things that's happening is that lots of the companies who've got communities now or have got online access panels are starting to put software onto their members' uh, PCs, onto their laptops, onto their tablets, onto their smartphones, and tracking their behavior with their consent, with their informed consent, and using that as a much richer source of data, merging it with the panel data to really enrich what they're doing. Linking to respondent social media, and in the second session of the, the main stage, Michael Rudberg is going to be talking about a project that he did where at the end of the survey he asked a simple question, um, can, we fen can we become your friend on Facebook and use that information? And about 250 people, I think it was, said yes. Got an enormous amount of information. Question we often ask people, what do you like? Which books do you read? But of course, if you're their Facebook friend, you know that and you can pull that information in. And this is going to be another way that we can get richer and richer information about the people we do surveys with and maybe do much shorter surveys that way. One of the things that um, my colleagues and I have been doing a lot of is doing social media listening, but then quantifying and validating those findings with conventional research. So we see a real spike of interest in something. So we know that there's an interest, but it's very hard to tell what that means from social media. But by simply running it even through an omnibus, you start to get a real feel, in fact, that's what that level of interest means this time. This is, these are the elements within that conversation that really seem to matter. And I expect to see that grow and grow. Um, so we also see people complementing traditional research with social media. Great paper a few weeks ago by Skopos and Porsche looking at comparing social media research with what they can find out from traditional sources. And something like 90% of what they could find out from traditional means, they could not find out from social media, which was interesting. That was 90% could not find out from social media. 10% they could find it out from social media. But half of what they learned from social media, they didn't find out from traditional. So it can add something. If you've got the budget and if you've got the skill and if you've got the teams, then what you can do is bring the two techniques together, remembering what we know about our traditional research and using this as an additional strand to the process. So what is coming next? Well, I think the thing that we really need to keep an eye on are there going to be masses of changes in legislation. Um, in Europe, for example, the, the European Commission are looking at making a right to be forgotten. That's going to have an impact on what we do. Um, what, is, what is okay to use? Where is consent acceptable? How should consent be recorded? If we're going to go into communities and read them, even if they're open, can we do that? What are the rules in different countries? What are the rules about intellectual property and copyright? What rules and um, 
procedures can the owners of sites, can the Facebooks put upon the use of the data. So this is going to change around the world probably every week in one country a rule or a guideline or a piece of legislation is going to change globally it's just going to be continually changing and we need to keep on the ball. I expect to see much much more tracking and logging. I think that people will become increasingly comfortable if they're given an incentive to say yeah you can track my, mo my mobile phone you can track my PC, um, I'm going to get slightly cheaper phone calls for that or I'm going to get slightly cheaper TV and we're going to be deluged with large data and we're going to have to spend quite a lot of time working out how to work with and how to process that larger data. I think we'll see much, much, um, quite a lot of improved demographics of comments. Now Google are taking one route with this which is that they are estimating the demographics and I think they're at about 70-75% accuracy um, by looking at what sort of things you say and about what sort of sites you visit and all these sorts of things. So we'll see some of that but as people start to say yes you can share my Facebook data then actually it becomes a lot easier to know which country somebody is in. So if somebody makes a post on the BBC's website but actually where that person's friend in Facebook we might know that they are in Johannesburg in South Africa and that they're female so we can start to take those comments from websites and actually assign some characteristics to them and also of course as we start to work with panels of people who said yes you can track me then we're going to see more integration there. I certainly expect to see text analytics improve massively. I think that um, we've had some overclaim. We've also seen the text analytics used with Twitter and I think that that is going to remain one of the most difficult areas to process clearly. Um, irony and joke are a major part of how people communicate in Twitter and that is hard uh, for people to use tech, for text analytics to process. Um, it doesn't normally have the proper pr uh, sentence structure. Um, it has a lot of misspelling and ambiguous meanings. So actually working with Twitter is one of the hardest things for text analytics. When we start working with longer posts, longer comments, I suspect that we're going to see a lot of improvement as well. I think we're going to see a lot more integration with MR. There is such an enormous pressure on us to ask shorter questions. Everybody is saying the market research questions, they're too long and they're too boring. But if we know who you are and we know who your friends are and we know what you're interested in and what you do, first of all, we can select people more accurately to do surveys, we don't have to ask as many questions and we can follow those questions up with some deeper data about people. The most scary thing I think for market researchers is not Google Consumer Surveys version 1, it probably won't be version 2, but I think that there is some real potential for version 3 or 4 or for some other imitation to come along which is fundamentally cheaper than market research as a solution, which will have a lot more artificial intelligence or it will have pre-structured work which you can apply. So it will become perhaps the standard way of tracking a brand. Here are the questions. Think about the way that NPS, Net Promoter Score, has become standardized. To think that actually if somebody came along and said instead of a million dollars a year, you could do your tracking with this consistent tool for $5,000 a year, some people somewhere are going to be tempted um, and those tools are simply going to get better and better. The, the tools we have today will be almost unrecognizable. So I've got three tips really in terms of where social media related research is going. The first is, as you might expect from where I come from commercially with the decisions I've made, absolutely you need to get into communities. Communities are going to be a major, major resource for brands. Researchers need to know how to work with the communities that brands are going to be owning and developing. Integrating social media with mainstream market research. I think this is going to be an enormously important thing for mainstream market researchers to do and I think it's going to be enormously important for the social media people to do because actually they've only got a small part of the answer their answer becomes much more useful if they work with market research. What would I say you should be experimenting on? Keep playing with different monitoring tools. Don't use one of these tools, become disappointed and leave it there. 
keep trying different monitoring tools. Absolutely get on top of text analytics. This is a fast developing field. Have a look at what Seth Grimes is doing with a lot of his uh, communities and discussions and, and seminars and conferences. This is going to explode in importance. And have a look at these tools for logging and following people as they use their mobile phone, as they use their PC. This is going to be a really important data tool. It's not going to be owned by market researchers. We need to know how to work with it, how to link our data to their data so that we can go forward in a really strong way. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and I look forward to questions.